Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great. I don't wanna go to work, cause my boss is a jerk, and I'm not even that pay. I need a change in my life, cause I don't feel alive, and there's nothing that makes me happy. Oh. Hold my beer for a minute I'm about to quit my job Cash in for a ticket I'm going on a trip And I don't plan to visit I'm gonna stay there Till I feel like I'm winning all And this is just Welcome friends In this video We are swapping out my shocks With rebuilt ones From Texas Shockworks Off-Road Fox says that these shocks Should be serviced Every 50,000 miles And I was well over that So during my search for a shop I came across Texas Shockworks And was very happy They have upgrade options Offer replacement hats and have an exchange program to keep you on the road. So I did the rears first since they are supposed to be an easy swap. I chalked the front tires and lifted the rear at the differential since my new bumper is too high for me to lift from the hitch. Then I threw some Sunex 10 ton jack stands under the frame and got to work removing the shocks. With the truck supported I used an 18mm wrench and 15mm socket and impact gun to remove the shocks axle mount bolt and nut. Next I disconnected the live valve wire on top of the frame before using a 15mm socket impact to remove the frame mount bolt. With the shock off, I used a 4mm allen key to loosen and remove the three shock guard bolts and pulled off the shock guard. Finally, I used a rivet pry tool to unclip the live valve wire and remove the solenoid using an adjustable wrench. Next, I pulled out the rebuilt shock from TSW. These are labeled left or right on the back of the shock, so you can't really mix them up. I immediately installed the solenoid to ensure proper routing, uh, and you'll notice that the rebuilt shocks have a Schrader valve installed on the reservoir, and they're missing the protective plastic cap under the body. I cleaned up the shock guards and installed them onto the rebuilt shock using some blue Loctite. Then I went and did a loose install of the shock mount bolts at the frame and the axle. The frame nut has an arm on it, which is why I didn't need a wrench to loosen and tighten it down. After the axle nut, I simply reconnected the live valve wire and did all of that over again for the passenger side. The passenger side did require me to use a wrench on the frame bolt though. Reinstallation is where I ran into trouble. The shock was longer than the droop, so I spent 30 minutes using a jack to compress the shock enough to slide the bolt in. Once both sides were good, I set the vehicle down, rolled it back and forth, and did the final torque. Both the upper and the lower were 66 foot-pounds. Moving on to the front, I pulled off all three skid plates and lifted the truck at the crossmember, throwing 6-ton jack stands under the frame. Then I removed the front wheels using a 21mm socket and impact gun before disassembling the front suspension. Taking apart the front suspension is not that fun, and you need to be wary of the lines and wires to make sure that nothing is damaged. I knocked out the driver's side since that was in the shade, and then I moved on to the passenger side to finish it out. First I disconnected the live valve wire, which is hard to reach on the driver's side since you have to get around the brake master cylinder and intake but it's easy on the passenger side since it's just on the frame in front of the strut bucket. Then I unbolted the upper shock mount using an 18 millimeter ratcheting wrench. I cannot stress how important it is to have a ratcheting wrench. When I installed my iBox springs, I did not have one and I nearly died of frustration. Uh, but after I got all three nuts removed, I pulled off the upper ball joint nuts. I have aftermarket ball joints in my upper control arms, so I removed the cotter pin and castellated nut from the spindle using a 19mm wrench, but the stock nut is 18mm and the ball joint bolt is 8mm. Next I removed the tie rod nut using a 10 and 21mm wrench, and then I removed the upper sway bar end link nut from the sway bar using an 8 and 18mm wrench. Finally, I removed the lower shock mount bolt using a 27mm wrench and a 30mm socket and impact gun. I used a ratchet strap to hold the spindle in place, but I ended up having to loosen it to actually pull the shock out since the Willwood brake lines were too short. Next, I cleaned up the shocks with a brush and some degreaser and threw them in my wife's car along with the rebuilt shocks to get swapped out. 
I bought the shock top hats from TSW at the same time, but they came in earlier than the shocks did, and they shipped directly from RPG Off-Road. These top hats are supposed to reduce the risk of failure by replacing the rubber bushing in the stock top hat with a uniball bearing, which prevents the suspension cycling from ripping the rubber bushing apart. The top hats come with different size bolts based on the model year, but do not come uh, with new nuts, so you can't just decide to jump from the smaller Gen 2 bolts to the larger Gen 3 bolts. Once you have them set up, you need to put the springs into a professional spring compressor and mark the orientation of the top hat. Then you compress the spring until you have some slack and loosen and remove the shock rod nut using a 15 millimeter socket and impact. Next, you rassle out the old shock guard and rubber isolator from the old top hat and then clean them up before installing into the new top hats. The old stuff will fit into the new top hat, uh, just have to use soapy water to slide them on and make sure that the isolator retains its orientation based on the marking. On the shocks, you need to swap over the bump stop and the lower isolator. If you have full size 37s, here is where you might want to also install bump stop spacers onto the rod to prevent full travel and the tires knocking off your fenders. Now to put it all back together, you slide on the lower misalignment spacer onto the rod and the upper onto the top hat bearing. Then you put the new top hat in the spring Throw the shock in from below, being careful not to knock out the upper spacer, and then torque down the rod nut to 41 foot-pounds. Then you release the pressure on the spring and take them home. Back at the house, I swapped out the solenoids and found that both new shocks had some like partially stripped out threads on the solenoid rods, but I was able to get them on with a little bit of work. With all of the swapping complete, it was time to reinstall. I threw the strut up into the bucket, loosely threaded on the nuts, and worked way too hard to get the shock into the lower control arm, protecting it with some tape on the bottom. Then it was just tightening everything back up and putting it all back together. One note for the new top hats. The bolts are screwed in from the bottom, which means that when you tighten the nuts, you might start loosening the bolts in the hat. Use some blue Loctite on the bolts in the hat and only torque the nuts to spec at 30 foot-pounds. For the lower shock mount nut, you need to get it to 406 foot-pounds. I ended up buying a 3 quarter inch electronic torque adapter and 3 quarter inch ratchet from Harbor Freight and used it with my jack bar to torque it to spec. The last time I did this, I only got it as tight as I could with a 24 inch breaker bar, but 406 foot pounds is way more than I thought it would be and definitely more than I did last time. Anyway, with the installation complete, I needed to pack up my old shocks into the box, the rebuilt ones came in, and I used most of the same padding, but I ended up having to add a little bit extra. Shipping was prepaid through FedEx, I just had to tape it on and take the box to Office Depot. The core return sticker was in the box along with some TSW stickers and candy, which I enjoyed after the hard work. So. Final thoughts are that the rebuild shock swap was worth it. This is only for the convenience of not having your truck on jack stands for a couple of weeks or having to drive a long distance for a good shop. I did go with the revalve to Bravo, added trader valves, Viton seals, shaft refinishing, and new bushings, along with RPG top hats. The out the door price was $2,977.18, including the $1,200 core charge. A few weeks after I placed the order, I received a phone call saying that they still haven't received any live valves in that they could swap out with mine, and that they could send me a shipping label to go ahead and send mine in for a 72-hour turnaround. I decided to wait uh, so I wouldn't have to rent a car or take time off of work. The shocks did end up shipping after 44 days and arrived 59 days after the original order. 
I swapped them out right away and returned within seven days, but didn't get back the deposit for another five weeks. So the total time from order to refund of deposit was 100 days. I don't think that this is a typical timeline. It did take them a long time to get in some live valves, and then they, they actually forgot to refund me, and I had to call to remind them. They were super friendly and helpful, so I didn't mind the wait, uh, but my wife was pretty grumpy about the slow turnaround. What? As far as the feel and the change of the new shocks, it feels stiffer in the corners on the road, but I don't really notice anything different off-road. Uh, I think with as little off-roading as I do, I could have gotten away with a rebuild at 100,000 miles, but I'm glad that I installed the new top hats. The RPG hats don't add any extra height, so they work great with lifted springs like iBox or geysers, and they give me peace of mind that the lift springs won't bust off the top hat while I'm driving down the road. Uh, I did try to convince myself that buying Fox factory shocks was a better option than a rebuild, but at five times the cost, it, it I just couldn't do it. Anyway, I hope this video helps you make a decision on your rebuild or top hat replacement, and I'll see you next time.